People vanish mysteriously all the time, but occasionally people also mysteriously appear out of nowhere, surprising and often deeply concerning those who discover them. Gil Perez. On October 26th, 1593, a soldier seemingly materialized out of nowhere at Plaza Mayor in Mexico City. The Plaza guards saw what they would later describe as a man walking in a trance, wearing a Philippine soldier uniform. As soon as he was noticed, he was arrested. It seemed unbelievable that he had somehow gotten into Plaza Mayor undetected due to the high level of security surrounding the palace where the viceroy of what was then New Spain resided. Upon being apprehended, the soldier claimed to be a Spaniard by the name of Gil Perez, who had up to that point been serving in Manila in the Philippines. He reported having been on patrol only three days earlier, as Manila soldiers stayed on high alert due to the unexpected assassination of the Philippines' governor general. Reportedly, he leaned against a wall to rest for a second, but after opening his eyes, he found himself at Plaza Mayor, across the ocean, where he had never been before, amongst differently attired soldiers. The people of New Spain had yet to hear any news of the governor's assassination, and had no reason to believe Gil Perez was telling the truth. His claims were dismissed by the guards, but they were not taken lightly. Rather than believe he had somehow teleported himself, the highly religious society branded him a devil worshipper or satanic servant and threw him in prison. The mysterious soldier was locked up for several months until a ship came in from Manila carrying news of the assassination. Even more extraordinary, upon hearing about the arrested Philippine soldier, a fellow soldier aboard the ship claimed to know Perez and to have seen him on October 23rd. The three days between each of his sightings meant Perez could not possibly have traveled by sea. Yet, rather than pursue a trial for witchcraft, devil work, or some other menacing interpretation of his sudden appearance in New Spain, the government released him. Bill Perez joined the crew of the ship from the Philippines and went on his way. Many have theorized about the strangeness of the case, with some crediting the quick transportation to an alien abduction, teleportation, portals, or impersonation. Either way, the truth remains a mystery, as the records from 1593 are incomplete. Rudolf Fentz. In June of 1950, a man in 19th century attire was spotted walking in confusion halfway through an intersection in New York City. Witnesses reportedly remembered him due to his out-of-date clothes. After he was hit by a cab, his belongings were examined by the police. In his pristine, out-of-touch clothes, they found pre-1870s banknotes, a copper token for an unheard-of saloon, a bill from a stable for horse care and carriage wash, and a letter from 1876. Investigators were shocked, theorizing that perhaps the 30-year-old had been some sort of 19th century aficionado, but an additional finding suggested a more mysterious possibility. In one of his pockets, they located a business card containing his address and name, Rudolf Fentz. A captain of the NYPD's missing persons department decided to follow the lead. Asking around the neighborhood where the address was located, the captain ran into a problem. No one seemed to know a Rudolph Fence. There was no record of him in the phone book, nor were there any matches for his fingerprints. No Rudolph Fence had been reported missing. Yet the captain refused to give up. Rudolph Fence Jr. was listed in a telephone directory from 1939. It seemed like a long shot, but once again, the captain chose to follow the lead. The results from the second search were arguably more productive. An elderly woman now lived in the apartment listed in the directory. Allegedly, she was Rudolph Fence Jr.'s widow. Collaborating with an inquiry, she claimed that her late husband's father had disappeared while out on a walk in 1876 at the age of 31, when her husband was still a child. An exhaustive search and a fruitless investigation were reportedly launched at the time. With this new information, the NYPD captain went to check the missing person report from 1876. The old woman's tale seemed truthful. Rudolph Fence had vanished in 1876 on an evening walk. The descriptions of his clothes matched the clothes retrieved from the 1950s man. The face of the 1950s man matched the picture included in the file. The captain was shaken to his core. Perhaps afraid of coming across as a madman, or perhaps even concerned of the implications the case could have, the captain dropped the findings from the official report of the investigation, but the story made it through, and much theorizing has been made over the possibility that Rudolph Fence traveled through time and space. The story appeared in a number of publications back through the 1950s, leaving many to wonder about its true origin. Christmas Sailor 
February 6, 1942, lookouts on Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean saw what they believed to be a Japanese submarine out at sea. They sent out a pilot boat and discovered a Carly float, which was then dragged to the shore. They found the belongings of a person who was sent to a medical examiner. A grave was dug near Flying Fish Cove. A blue boiler suit that had been found was now white from exposure. It reportedly had four plain press studs. Other than that, there were no identifying documents, tags, or any personal objects to go off of. The one object that could be of any help was a shoe, but word of mouth and written records disagree about the exact words on it. Some claimed it said Crown 4, while others claimed it was branded McCohen or McEwen. Others claimed it was not a shoe, but rather a pair of boots. Written reports on the findings were destroyed during the Japanese occupation, and medical records disappeared, along with their conclusions. A popular theory was that the life raft came from the HMAS Sydney, since the metal framework read, quote, Lysat Dua Enil Zinc, made in Australia. Damage to the float had been made by guns or shell fire. The underside of the float was packed with barnacles, meaning it had floated at sea for a long period of time. In April of 1949, the Director of Naval Intelligence sent the Director of Vittling a note asking whether the float could have come from the Sydney. But the director of Vittling pointed out that the Navy had never adopted suits with press studs such as the one found. Royal Australian Navy officers often purchase their own boiler suits, however, so he left that element open to the possibility. Other than that fact, the rest of the note was mostly ignored. Later on, the Royal Australian Navy stated that the covering of the float was not the same as that used by their warships, which meant it could not possibly have come from the Sydney. In 1998, the Joint Standing Committee for Foreign Affairs, Defense, and Trade inquired about the matter, searching for the unmarked grave to obtain DNA to compare to the relatives of the Sydney crew, in an attempt to assess whether the loss of the float had come from an unknown sailor aboard the cruiser. The grave was not found until a second search in 2006 locating it. After a ceremony with full military honors, the content of the gravesite were moved to the Commonwealth War Graves part at the Geraldton Cemetery in November of 2008. The DNA gathered was compared to relatives of the personnel from the Sydney, but no match was found. The origin of the Carly Floatman was never identified. Man in the Cylinder During the Blitzkrieg, an area between Great Homer Street and the A-59 in Liverpool was bombed to the ground. The area went untouched after first responders dealt with the fire, but in 1943, a crew of American soldiers took a bulldozer and shovels to level the ground and take out any rubble. One of them uncovered a metal cylinder six feet nine inches long with a diameter of 19 inches. At first, they worried it was an explosive, but upon further examination was deemed harmless. The cylinder was left in the area and was integrated into the neighborhood, used as a bench or as an object for children to run around and jump on while playing. In July of 1945, one of those children discovered through a small hole made by a bulldozer at one end which had deteriorated progressively, a skeleton's foot. Police Chief Robert Bailey was called in and an investigation was launched. A local welder was asked to open up the cylinder. Inside was a full skeleton in Victorian clothes. A notice from the London Northwestern Railway from 1885 and some illegible papers were found. These were restored, revealing a receipt and account sheets for the T.C. Williams & Co. Company. He had a gold ring with a bloodstone inscribed 1859. Looking into the T.C. Williams & Co. Company, it was uncovered that it was a paint manufacturing plant that closed in 1884. It was theorized that the owner, Thomas Cregeen Williams, may be the person whose remains were found. Yet the investigators could not determine how he ended up inside the cylinder. Furthermore, it was rumored that Williams had changed his name and moved abroad after his company failed. The identity of the cylinder man has yet to be determined. Monsieur Chuchani. Monsieur Chuchani lived under a made-up name, and his true identity and origin remains a mystery to this day. With no published work, Chuchani's most recognizable accomplishment was his profound effect on the Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel and on the famous philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who once referred to his tutor as a quote, wonderful teacher. Reportedly disheveled in character, Monsieur Chuchani was often described as dirty and unpleasant, with Vizel even going so far as to write that he, quote, looked like a hobo turned clown, or a clown playing hobo. Despite his outward appearance, Chuchani touched the hearts and minds of his students, speaking on matters of philosophy, mathematics, and theology. Both of his standout students credit his teaching skills with contributing immensely to their work. 
Yet the messy teacher remained an enigma to his students, taking many of his secrets to the grave. Virtually nothing is known about the teacher's origins. The few details of his life that are known include that he resided in Paris post-World War II from 1947 to 1952, that he materialized in either Israel or Paris from time to time as if by thin air, and that he spent his final years in Uruguay. His birth year is said to have been 1895, but such a date is uncertain, with no tangible evidence of age or birthplace. Even his name remained a mystery to those that knew him. Tutrani has been theorized to be a biblical reference to the city of Shushan, today Iran, but it's unknown if that was part of his real name or whether he assigned it to himself. The anonymity and secrecy followed him to the very end. His headstone in Montevideo, written by Ella Vizel, reads, quote, The wise Rabbi Chutrani of blessed memory, his birth and his life are sealed in enigma. <laughs>